So welcome to this panel, which we are going to talk about abortion in the courts, the existence of a right to life. So since we're on Constitution Day, I thought we'd compare the competing provisions of the Constitution on this question. On the one hand, we have the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which says that life, liberty, property, will not be denied without a due process of law. Weighing against that, we have an emanation from a penumbra. <laughs> so what weighs heavier? Obviously, the emanations. Um, that's where we are today, but there's a lot going on in the law. You would think that in terms of the decision to have an abortion, that the government's not there uh, pushing an agenda. Well, California just passed a law to make the abortion pills available in all college uh, health centers uh, at taxpayer dollar. The governor hasn't signed it yet, but it's been passed. Um, and then we have situations like a, a story that crossed the wires this morning is a doctor who passed away earlier this month and they found the remains of 10,000 fetuses in his house. The stories had been that he had performed an abortion on a girl as young as 10 the story was that she'd been raped by her uncle, yet he sent her home with her parents, nonetheless, who had allowed the uncle access to her. Um, when this doctor was in Chicago in the, in the 80s, he and another doctor would race to see how many abortions could be performed in a single day. So you can argue that's just a matter of a woman's choice, but you can also see how it affects our basic dignity as human beings. Well, now states are starting to fight back. We have states with fetal heartbeat laws. We have states with fetal pain laws, saying that you can't do an abortion once we've reached the point where we, scientifically we know that the fetus will feel pain. And we also have uh, states, I think a couple of our panelists have written on this, that have non-discrimination laws, that we're not going to allow abortions where the purpose of the abortion is for sex selection or to kill somebody uh, who is going to be disabled, the Down syndrome baby. We have a tremendous uh, panel. I will refer you to their bios in the program, so I don't take time reading to you their tremendous qualifications. Um, we're going to give them each 15 or so minutes, and I'm going to start with uh, Dorinda Bordley. Dorinda, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I, I recently cleaned my closet out, and I realized that I had shoes that were 25, 30 years old. Any other ladies in here have that same problem? Okay. And I bring that up because, because I want to start with, um, with the words of the Supreme Court. And again, happy Constitution Day. I wish that I had some constitutional provisions to discuss with you, but most of what I will discuss with you is policy because abortion law is based on policy decisions on how we value human life and the, the life and health of the woman. And the Supreme Court, in the words of Justice Antonin Scalia, has become uh, the nation's abortion control board. It is legislation from the bench. So um, the, I wanted to make you aware of how, what words the court used. Where did it ground this wonderful right to choose to terminate your pregnancy? in the U.S. Constitution. Well, it couldn't quite find a place, as, as this gentleman mentioned, the penumbras and, and uh, the emanations, but they did say this. In 1992, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, when the court reaffirmed the central holding of Roe versus Wade, they said, this is their reasoning, legal reasoning. For two decades, again, that's the two decades, so that's a factor to them, as 20 years have gone by, you know, I have shoes older than that. But for two decades of economic and social developments, people have organized intimate relationships and made choices that define their views of themselves and their places in society in reliance on the availability of abortion in the event that contraception should fail. So here's the court saying, look, for 20 plus years, We've allowed you to have intimate relationships, i.e. empty sex, where 
you have now relied on abortion as backup for birth control. What that has to do with the U.S. Constitution, we, we don't know. And then the court said this, the ability of women to participate equally, okay, I'm a woman, I have three daughters, I'm all for equal treatment in the workplace and all other places, but this ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive lives. So here's the court um, as philosopher kings adopting the philosophy of radical feminism that we as women can't be equal unless we can destroy our own unborn children and risk our bodies, lives, and souls to do that. And so when this decision came out in 92, I was just out of law school. I had a couple of kids at that time. I've had a couple more since. And I've been able and gifted and to be able to use my law degree, my business background to, to advocate for the right to life and for women's, women's rights and health and how abortion impacts women. And so I looked at that and said, wait, do we really need abortion for equality? So I did a, a little research, and I just wanna share this with you before I, I share some of the other policies that are at stake in this debate. Susan B. Anthony, as you know, the suffragette that fought for the woman's right to vote, she said this about abortion. This is 1869, she said of abortion, it will burden her conscience in life, it will burden her soul in death, but oh, thrice guilty is he who drove her to the desperation which impelled her to the crime. This is the beginnings of the Me Too movement, okay? <laughs> where, where we see the, the seeds of legalized abortion facilitating the sexual exploitation of women to where men, some men, can use women as sex objects and then leave us with the, the desperation and the fallout, right? Her colleague, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, said, when we consider that women are treated as property and we were treated as chattel in the law, so she said, when we consider that we as women are treated as property, it is degrading to women that we should treat our children as property to be disposed of as we see fit. Then Alice Paul is my favorite. Who is Alice Paul? She was the original drafter of the Equal Rights Amendment. And that Equal Rights Amendment was simply following upon the heels of women's right to vote. We were still being treated unfairly in the workplace. And so that, that amendment was for fair treatment in the workplace before it was hijacked by a little group called the National Organization for Women who made it into an abortion issue. But Alice Paul, when asked about that, said these words, very simple, abortion is the ultimate exploitation of women. These, this was echoed later at the 30th anniversary of Roe versus Wade by one of my friends and heroes, Professor Marianne Glendon of Harvard Law School. She said this, to earlier feminists who had fought for the vote and for a fair treatment in the workplace, it had seemed obvious that the ready availability of abortion would facilitate the sexual exploitation of women. So I raise all this because um, we have found over the past 25 years since Casey that a pro-woman, pro-life policy has been very successful. Before that, you had the pro-life movement speaking about the rights of the child, the heart, you know, abortion stops a beating heart, and you had the pro-choice movement saying this is about women's access and equality, and so you have baby, woman, baby, woman. Well, well who's gonna win in that? We all care about both, right? And in pregnancy, it's a very unique medical condition where you have interests of both the woman and the child. And so we have worked with doctors over these decades to, to show how what hurts the child by killing it ultimately also hurts the woman and there's fallout on abortion breast cancer risk, there's psychological, four times increased risk of suicide. All of these things have played out in the social experiment of abortion on demand, imposed, constitutionalized upon our nation. And we have now a silent army, not, not so silent, an army of post-abortive women that are really the, the secret sauce to the success of the pro-life movement because they sit at committee tables and speak of what abortion did to them and their life. And so you'll see 
laws that have been passed and then upheld under Casey, um, where, where Casey not only split the baby in saying the states have a right, not only can we uh, affirm this right to terminate your pregnancy, that core abortion right, but they said the states, the state's interest in um, protecting women's health and protecting human life are also to be taken into account in this constitutional balance. And so when they make up the rules as they go through the years, they came up with this concept that, and they, and they frequently say, we allow states to prefer childbirth over abortion. And state after state, the red states, have done so. They have passed pro-life legislation year after year after year that give women information and resources to be able to choose life and not have to undergo this trauma of abortion. What are some of those things? I'm gonna highlight a few of them because what, what, what we see here is we're standing on the precipice of what's going to happen in the 2020 presidential election, right? And you'll have um, in our upcoming speakers a view of what will happen to abortion law and policy if uh, the White House is, is taken by Democrats and the Senate, and then what will happen if there's additional pro-life justices appointed and the Trump administration continues. So that will be coming up. But I wanted you to have a survey of what type of laws are on the books that would be struck down um, if the Democrats come into control. And this, you know, that's not my speculation. They outright say that they would strike all these laws down. And as you know, earlier in um, earlier this year, New York lit up the Freedom Tower in pink to celebrate their codification of Roe versus Wade abortion on demand, right? They celebrate it. And so that celebration was claimed to be to protect women's health. Now, who isn't for protecting women's health? And as Nick will point out more later, you have to realize that that code word, what does health mean in the abortion context? What people don't realize is that the same day that Roe versus Wade was um, put out, there was a companion decision called Doe versus Bolton. And they talked about health in the abortion context because before viability, and this is post Casey, before viability, a state can regulate abortion, it can have certain rules and regulations. After viability, a state can prohibit, right, or prescribe completely, a ban abortion after viability, except to protect the health of the mother. Well, what's the loophole? Health. This is in the words of the Supreme Court. All these factors pertain to health. Physical, okay, emotional, all right, psychological, okay, that's maybe all in the realm of health, familial, and the woman's age. Familial, I don't want children, I don't want a family, I already have too many children, the woman's age. All these factors pertain to health. And so that health decision, that health definition back from 1973 is what made abortion on demand through all nine months of pregnancy allowable. But remember, for so long we thought, oh, it's just in the first trimester. It's just up to viability. And now we see, we see New York lighting up the Freedom Tower for abortion on demand and even after birth. Speaking of after birth, I wanted to point out that last week, the US Congress, House of Representatives, held a hearing on the what's called the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. So you all have heard about this. The child is um, born alive during an abortion, whether it was induced because of some health issue or whether it was a regular elective abortion. The child is born alive. Normally, if you kill the child or allow the child to die, that's called homicide or neglect, medical neglect, medical malpractice. But now we want to make that a constitutionally protected right. Where was this hearing held with experts and so forth? It was held last week, uh, sponsored by my congressman, Steve Scalise, at the White House Visitor Center. 
Now I'm thinking, Steve, that's a little, you know, that's your grandstand in here in the White House Visitor Center. And then I kept reading that it was held in the Visitor Center because Speaker Pelosi refused to approve an official committee room. So we can't even speak about these practices in our Congress. That's what we have to look forward to if things go, go downhill. The backlash, of course, was that states, uh, especially across the South, started passing heartbeat laws, banning abortion when you can detect a fetal heartbeat. And of course, all of these laws, and the ones that I'm gonna discuss in a moment, they have, they have two purposes, maybe three. Number one, life protective regulations, um, such as ultrasound laws and so forth, educate the woman about the life of the unborn child, but when they're in the committee hearing rooms, they're educating the public as well, because the news likes to cover controversy, right? And so whether a bill gets passed or not, often it will be brought because it's public education. And public education is needed to change hearts and minds, and hearts and minds are needed to elect people that eventually become president and appoint judges. And so we're, need, we're needing to do that. Some of them are made as a frontal attack on Roe versus Wade, and, and that's what these heartbeat bills are. It's basically an abortion ban, and what they would do if they were to be upheld would be to reverse Roe and Casey. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean abortion would go away. It simply means that the abortion issue would go back into the states, into the democratic process, right? And you would have women able to tell their stories. You'd have doctors being able to tell the stories of how uh, these babies react. And so what's on the table are common sense laws like ultrasound requirements where women have uh, come to the table saying, I asked to see the ultrasound of the baby and they wouldn't let me see it. Okay, they wouldn't allow me to see it. No one's gonna force these women to look at it. They're going to, they're gonna be offered, that they're required to um, offer that option if they want to. Informed consent for abortion allows women to get a booklet that has the develop, pictures of the developing unborn child at two week increments. You can see little words on, on how this child is developing, what your baby looks like, what the medical risks are to you, short term and long term, and then a list of alternatives where you can go, public and private agencies that help you bring your child to term or to seek adoption if that's what you want. These are vehemently opposed, vehemently opposed by the pro-choice movement. God forbid you have information to make a choice, right? But these are opposed and would be struck down under, under future regimes if they came into power. Partial birth abortion bans were vehemently opposed as well. And um, now we have going up in the courts dismemberment bans. What does that mean? Sorry to tell you this after lunch, but the most common method of second trimester abortion is what the doctors call in depositions disarticulating the child, which is removing the child piece by piece from the womb. First the arms, legs, torso, head, dismembering the child while it's still alive. These laws would require you to, to kill the child first, usually with an injection, before you dismember the child alive. But the court has since um, declined to take that up on, on cert. There's not a split in the circuits yet. I'm gonna wrap this up with the words of Justice Thomas. Just this summer, um, in an opinion he was concurring on, he said, uh, this case does not present the opportunity to address our demonstrably erroneous undue burden standard. That is the standard that the court used in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. So here's Thomas, and he set out the whole intellectual framework on why the court's abortion jurisprudence is demonstrably erroneous. Um, we'll let our other speakers get more into that. Thank you very much. Now from the academic side, we have Professor David Forte from Cleveland State University. Professor. Thank you. Speaking of penumbras, the late great humorist and speech writer, M. Stanton Evans, once mused, if he could form a liberal 
uh, journal, he would call it Beyond the Penumbra. <laughs> and one of the lead articles would be a claim for de, uh, um, a legalization of all drugs. And the title would be, Give Me Librium <laughs> or Give Me Meth. <laughs> Uh, in 1802, Thomas Jefferson might have probably caused John Marshall a lot of sleepless nights. Uh, his Jeffersonian Republicans had destroyed the circuit court judges by repealing an 1801 act. He had prevented the, the Supreme Court from meeting at all during 1802. There were rumors of impeachment proceedings that were going to be hatched to get at the Supreme Court, John Marshall knew what everyone else knew is that, that Thomas Jefferson was looking for a one-party state, a one-party ideological state. This year, Democratic Senators Sheldon Whitehouse, Maisie Hirono, Richard Blumenthal, Richard Durbin, and Kirsten Gildebrand uh, filed a brief in which they claimed that the same right-wing groups that had been winning five to four majorities were the same ones that supported nomination of justices like Brett Kavanaugh in the brief to the Supreme Court. And this is what they said. Quote, from October term 2005 through October term 2017, the court issued 78 five to four or five to three opinions in which justices appointed by Republican presidents provided all five votes in the majority. In 73 of these five to four decisions, they, they, cases concerned interests important to big funders, corporate influencers, and the political base of the Republican parties. And each of these 73 cases, those partisan interests prevailed. They were counting, just as Judge Santel counseled that they should not count. And this is what the brief concluded. Perhaps the court can heal itself before the public demands it be restructured in order to reduce the influence of politics. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, Senator Kamala Harris and other Democrats floated the idea of packing the court in the next administration to permit the appointment of liberal justices. And so I'm wondering whether they are trying to keep Justice, Chief Justice Roberts awake at night with the same plan as Thomas Jefferson had. The central issue driving such senators, of course, is abortion. Their objective is to have Chief Justice Roberts blink and leave Roe v. Wade where it is until the Democrats can take control in 2020. Thereafter, as some Democrats have admitted, the upholding of Roe will be the litmus test of any nominee brought before the Senate. But the campaign to intimidate the court into inaction on the abortion front is not limited to external political threats and pressure. The primary tactic is to raise the principle of stare decisis to iconic status and to do so from within the court. The foremost adherents are Justices Kagan and Breyer and their words are taking direct aim at any attempt to overrule Roe v. Wade. For example, in June in the case called Nick versus Township of Scott, Chief Justice Roberts for the five-person majority overturned a precedent that had prevented property owners from lodging takings claims against the government in federal court before they had to exhaust their claims in state court. Justice Kagan for the dissenters declared that the majority's decision, quote, transgresses all usual principles of stare decisis. She goes on, under cover of overruling only a single decision, today's opinion smashes a hundred plus years of legal rulings to smithereens. She's got a kind of um, Scalia-like nuance to her uh, <laughs> rhetoric. Kagan called to mind Justice Breyer's defense of stare decisis in a very recent case called Franchise Tax Board of California versus Hyatt, in which Justice Breyer had said that it was improper for a court to reverse a precedent, quote, 
only because five members of a later court decide it was incorrect. <laughs> Back in Nick, the Nick case in which Justice Kagan wrote about precedence, she seconded Justice Breyer's position. She said, the entire idea of stare decisis is that judges do not get to reverse a decision just because they never liked it in the first instance. They need a reason, and she emphasized the next two words, other than the idea that the precedent was wrongly decided. <laughs> in emphasizing that a wrongly decided precedent cannot be overturned on the mere fact of its mistakenness, Kagan was laying down a marker against Justice Kavanaugh. You may recall that at his hearing, Kavanaugh declared that Roe was a precedent, and that adding in Casey, one had a precedent upon precedent. He got confirmed, and it may have been a Pyrrhic victory. That is certainly a quote Kagan could use against him if he seeks to overturn Roe. But, as they say late at night, there is more. <laughs> at oral argument in Gamble versus the United States, this had to do about the double jeopardy clause. <laughs> this is not a First Amendment class. <laughs> All hecklers will be ejected. <laughs> Tell Siri she's out of here. <laughs> At oral argument in Gamble versus the United States, in which the appellant was seeking to have the court overturned the precedent that a defendant may be charged in federal as well as state court for the same action without violating the self-incrimination clause, Justice Kavanaugh stated at oral argument, stare decisis is a principle, in my view, rooted in Article Three of the Constitution. As Federalist 78 points out, he's calling upon Holy Scripture here, <laughs> and as and he's saying, uh, these are his words, and as Justice Kagan points out, he goes on. It's a doctrine of stability and humility that we take seriously. And the reason, he's going on, with the bar that you have to clear, I believe, is not just to show that it's wrong, but to show that it's grievously wrong, egregiously wrong something meaning a very high bar because stare decisis is itself a constitutional principle. Now, one might think that Kagan was digging himself into an even deeper hole with his defense of precedent. But perhaps it gives him an out in regard to Roe v. Wade. For it is certain to most constitutional scholars, including liberal scholars, that constitutionally speaking, Roe v. Wade was egregiously wrong. And that is why Kagan continues to emphasize that it is not enough to overturn a precedent because it was wrongly decided. Nor does Kagan believe that a hoary precedent can be done away with because of successive whittling down of its applications by later courts. That's interesting. That's what happened with Brown versus the Board of Education. Remember, there were a number of cases that whittled down Plessy. She doesn't think that's good. In the majority opinion of Nick, that's the takings case, Chief Justice Roberts said precisely that in overruling the previous precedent, had said precisely that in overruling previous precedent, that it was because whittling down of previous precedents had led the original case to be weakened. And in doing so, he cited the case of Janus versus AFSCME. That was the labor union case, where the court had held that non-members of a labor union could not be compelled to not only not uh, pay any uh, agency fees, but no dues at all. And he cited that in, in Janus, in which he overruled Detroit versus Abood, after a number of pre previous cases had weakened Abood. Now, Roberts was undoubtedly trying to get Kagan's goat on this, because Kagan had a huge dissent in this case, in the AFSCME case, and most of the dissent was based on the fact that, that it, it violated <coughs> stare decisis. But in Nick, Kagan was not going to let Roberts to get away with that. Miffed, she wrote. And anyway, 
Isn't that nice? That justice rights. And anyway, <laughs> evolution, in a way the decision is described, has never been a ground for abandoning stare decisis. Here, the majority's only citation is to last term's decision overruling a 40-year precedent. If that is the way the majority means to proceed, relying upon one subversion of stare decisis to support another, we may as well not have any principles about precedence at all. But in Nick, the same case, Kagan was not done in building a protective wall against a possible future attack on Roe. She went out of her way to announce that reliance interests on a previous precedent are a plus factor. And when they exist, Sari Decisis becomes, quote unquote, superpowered. That's an explicit reference to one of the major justifications in the plurality opinion of Casey for upholding Roe that so many women had relied upon it to build their lives over the previous 20 years. In a case the year before, Justice Breyer had, in which a precedent was overturned, Justice Breyer had mused in a written stage whisper, today's decision can only cause one to wonder which cases the court will overrule next. To which Kagan responded darkly in the next case, Nick, well, that didn't take long. Now one may wonder again. Knowing what Kagan and Breyer are up to, Justice Clarence Thomas undertook, undertook an extensive essay on the nature of stare decisis in his concurrence in Gamble versus the United States. That's the double jeopardy case. He forthrightly declared that the standards for invoking stare decisis, such as a change of need circumstances perhaps, or long-term reliance wasn't there, uh, was invalid to preserve a badly decided precedent. That does not comport, he says, with our judici judicial duty under Article 3 because it elevates demonstrably erroneous decisions, meaning decisions outside of the realm of permissible interpretation over the text of the Constitution. He powerfully concludes, quote, a demonstrably incorrect judicial decision is tantamount to making law and adhering to it both disregards the supremacy of the Constitution and perpetuates a, per a usurpation of legislative power. Of course, the liberal defenders on the court cannot directly and publicly tell Justice Roberts and Justice Cavan not to take any cases that can lead to Rose overruling, but their intellectual allies have. Professor Lawrence Tribe has declared that the Roberts Court is increasingly intended to treat long-established precedent as entitled to no special respect. And other liberal academics have weighed in on this. Um, I'm told I only have a few minutes. I'll take my friend Hadley Arcus' advice and finish the rest of my uh, address in Hebrew and skip the vowels. <laughs> I will, I will conclude. Did you shut me off? <laughs> no, no, it's going on. Am I still speaking? No. Well, it still says it's on. Doobie dooby doo. It doesn't work. <laughs> Project. <laughs> use that one. <laughs> you may use that one. Okay, there, there we go. Uh, right. You're demoted. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'll conclude with this parallel. I have much more to say on a point, which is the liberals are getting much pro-life support of the highest level in the pro-life movement and urging Chief Justice Roberts not to overrule Roe v. Wade. And that is a serious, serious, it's splitting the pro-life movement to the core. But this is, we're getting back to Justice Roberts and staying awake at night. You recall that in, uh, in 2012, 2012, the case of NFIB versus Sibelius was decided in which the Supreme Court, with Justice Roberts switching at the last minute, upheld Obamacare. And this is what I think Justice Roberts was thinking at that time. Number one, there was an issue of the Commerce Clause. 
and I sided with the four-person conservative majority, and we moved the constitutional law forward on the Commerce Clause. That'll stick. Number two, there was an issue on the Spending Clause, and for the first time we were able to move with the four-person conservative uh, with me to, to move that forward constitutionally. And in the Necessary and Proper Clause, which the court had not very much at all limited the use of by Congress, he thought he had moved that forward. But taxing, taxing, I'm not going to call this a penalty, as the law said. I'm going to call it a tax. And uh, therefore, the tax part is valid, and the whole law then can be valid. And he said, and he's thinking to himself, how do I know? Mm, I don't know, but he's thinking to himself. <laughs> Tax is the third rail of politics. And if we strike down Obamacare in the 2012 election, the Supreme Court will be the issue. And we will lose. And Obama will win. And everybody from the New York Times down across uh, small town newspapers will say Obama won because the people voted for Obamacare and against the Supreme Court, and what prestige would be left for the Supreme Court after that. Now, he's looking at 2020. To most observers, it seems to me it's going to be a Democratic blowout. There's going to be a Democratic president, and there's going to be a Democratic senator. At least it's very possible to Roberts. If he overrules Roe now, I'm thinking he may be thinking, that will be the 2020 issue. And if the Democrats win in 2020 because of Donald Trump, not because of that, nonetheless, every news broadcast on the left will say it was a repudiation of the court's overruling of Roe v. Wade. And with the Democrats have the House and the Senate and the presidency, they will pass a freedom of choice law that will be national. And I think that might be frightening him. No, I don't have any more happy news for you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, last up is Nicholas Nikos, who has relatives both from Greece and from Italy, both of whom speak very, very quickly, which is good because we're over time. <laughs> <laughs> I would use the microphone, but then I wouldn't be able to speak at all. Um, Dave, we, we met David, Dorinda and I met David. Dorinda's my law partner. People ask, are you married? And we say, no, we only fight like we're married. But um, we met uh, David last night. He told us what he was going to say tonight. And when he finished last night, I said to Dorinda, well, Mrs. Lincoln, did you like the play? <laughs> <laughs> I also looked over when Dorinda was speaking, and I saw she was reading, but I thought she was maybe watching TV. So I thought I'd watch the Notre Dame game while I spoke. You wouldn't mind. With no, I'm sorry. They're winning 52 to 7, so I just want you to know that. Um, last year, one of the things that we do at Bioethics Defense when we're public interest lawyers, we do full-time pro-life law. We do a lot of teaching. We do a lot of speaking at law schools and med schools. Last year, I was invited to speak and debate at George Washington University a Law School in D.C. during the Kavanaugh hearings on the issue of should Roe v. Wade be overturned. Now, you can imagine that was a non-controversial issue uh, at that time and place. Um, but the good news despite uh, David's somewhat uh, <laughs> grim prognosis, is, uh, is that the students listened. We had no Antifa demonstrations, and we made arguments. So there were two of us, uh, Mary Hassan from the Heritage Foundation and I, and uh, two uh, pro-abortion, uh, one professor and one uh, practitioner. But the students listened, and uh, I thought there was, there was hope. We can still make arguments to people. We all know that uh, almost 47 years ago, the Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade decided that women have a federal constitutional right to an abortion before viability, and as Dorinda pointed out, it's after viability if the physician, the, the abortionist, decides that the woman has a health reason, and health is so broad it means anything. Okay. So when people say Roe v. Wade legalized abortion, first thing to point out is it really is not true. It constitutionalized the issue. And because it constitutionalized the issue, only the Supreme Court can, can uh, really reverse itself. So what has happened is, with all due respect to Judge Santel, who is a hero of mine, um, 
the federal courts have become the Praetorian guards for the last 46 years, right? No matter how reasonable and how common sense the legislation that Dorinda works a lot on, you just can't get it passed if, if a judge decides it violates the Constitution. Uh, narrowly, if you look at all these decisions, the Supreme Court said this, uh, women have a right to quote, this is the quote, over and over in the cases, terminate her pregnancy, terminate her pregnancy. Now I have a friend who's an ob -gin. He says, I terminate pregnancies every day. They're called births, <laughs> okay? So he's obviously not talking about births. He's talking about what? Death. What, right? Death, of course. So you would think that the fundamental issue at the dawn of this, think about this as we know, there are 50 to 60 million Americans who should be walking around and are not. So you would think you'd ask, what is the it in the womb that you're trying to terminate? Um, which is amazing when you think that, as you probably all know, that Justice Blackmun punted on the fundamental issue. We need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins. What? <laughs> then he goes on to say, when those trains in medicine, theology, and philosophy can't agree, can't reach consensus, his word, then the, the judiciary isn't going to speculate. Now, a couple things about that. One, you would think that... Um, if you didn't know what you had, when I talk to students all the time, med students, law students, doesn't matter, I say, if you're on a country road and you're driving it and it's very foggy at night and you see something above you about 100 yards away and you go, is that a cow? Is that a person? Is that a post? Is that a mirage? The one thing you don't do is gun it, okay, because you don't <laughs> care. Um, secondly, and this is something that uh, Professor Hadley Arcus has pointed out, if consensus is required, Right? There's no consensus, Justice Blackman said. Well, then I can simply say, well, I have no consensus with your view on abortion. Why doesn't that work? And finally, in no other area, Dorinda and I do a lot of talks in bioethics, cloning, three parent embryos. We just spoke a couple days ago at the uh, Orange County Federal Society. It was a, it was a great uh, event. Um, in no other area do we use 1970s science. Right? Now, I'm 62. Uh, I know I look like I'm 82, but I'm 62. I had five, five uh, teenagers, that's what did it to me. Um, <laughs> I remember the days when the phone was on the wall, and there was a long cord, and a, a girl called me, and my sister was there. I was like, turning around, and, you know, <laughs> and, and trying to not... Well, we don't do that anymore. Now we use cell phones, right? How come we use 1974 science? Look, there's no question. In every medical school we've talked to with medical professors there who probably think abortion is a great thing, there's no question, as a matter of embryology, okay? A new human being comes into existence at the moment of sperm-egg fusion. Just a matter of science, okay? It's an inconvenient truth to a lot of people, but that's just the reality. You can debate whether we should protect that human being, but you can't simply add any more, even though you keep hearing it, it's, it's that it's not a human being. It is a human being, okay? And the issues that we deal with go far beyond abortion. Think about human cloning, three parent embryos, animal-human hybrid embryos. CRISPR, the gene editing program, is going to allow you to do all kinds of things. That's a, another talk, but just know it. Um, the reasons that Roe should be reversed, even if you think abortion is good, is there was a lack of evidentiary record. I don't know if anyone knows this. Maybe you all do. There, is absolutely, there was absolutely no record in Roe and Doe. Okay, why? Because it went up on a procedural question, Younger versus Harris abstention. The, the, law, the lawyers will remember that from law school. Basically, you can't collaterally attack in federal court a state pending state criminal uh, case. And so they thought that you can look at it in the papers. The justices just thought, well, we're, this is just a perfect case to bring up younger abstention, except they went wild with it. There was absolutely no record. All the, all the claims, abortion is safer than childbirth, are all false. It's just manufactured, maybe from amicus briefs, but there's no record. Usually the idea in our system is the adversarial process sharpens truth. You bring in evidence, you bring in your expert, and then you have a discussion. None. Zero. Secondly, there's no historical foundation for abortion. Now, Justice Blackmun seizes on two things. He seizes on quickening and the born alive rule and says, oh, look, they didn't protect unborn life. Wrong. The quickening rule and the born alive rule were rules of medical evidence given the primitive medical science they had. Here's the experience that people have even today, unfortunately. You're pregnant, and then a child is born, or you're assaulted, and then the child is born dead. Okay? Now we can tell whether the assault in the womb caused the death of the child, but 300 years ago they could not. 
So the quickening rule was if you could feel the child, that was evidence the child was there, or if you, um, if you, uh, if the child was born alive and then died, you knew the child was alive. But what Justice Blackman did was take a rule of medical evidence and make it a substantive rule. There's no historical foundation for the right to abortion. Uh, third, so, so all the medical assumptions, again, in all these cases is just manufactured. And finally, uh, as was talked about by both Dorinda and uh, Professor Forte, the, uh, the reliance interest and everything else. Um, one of the talks I want to create is called, you have to do this in law schools to get their attention, effed up. I wouldn't use the rest of that, but F, you can imagine that word, and it's not friend. Um, five colon, five times the Supreme Court got it horribly, terribly wrong. Dred Scott, Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. Buck versus Bell, forcible sterilization. Kuramatsu, the Japanese internment case. And the fifth one would be Roe. I would be happy, people would love me right up until I got to the fifth case. Um, what would a, so for all those reasons, even if you thought abortion was good, and I probably in this room you don't, or many of you don't, um, it should be overturned as a matter of constitutional honesty. Secondly, think about it, before 1973, do you think the average person cared who was on the Supreme Court? Maybe if you were a judge or a lawyer, okay? Our politics have been ripped to shreds. Everything is going bad. What would an overruling decision look like? You want to know what an overruling decision would look like? Go read Washington versus Glucksburg the 1997 Supreme Court case that held that there was no federal constitutional right to assisted suicide. Now, what were the reasons the court gave? Now, I'll tell you, this is five years after Casey reaffirmed Roe. Everyone was shocked. Everyone said, there's no way uh, that we're, they're going to create a Roe v. Wade of assisted suicide. It was 9-0, different reasons, but 9-0 on the judgment. Unanimous judgment, no federal constitutional right to assisted suicide. What were the reasons that states could ban assisted suicide? Here they are. Supreme Court said states have an unqualified interest in the preservation of human life, end quote. And you go, that's great. And then you go, but how about abortion? Uh, states could act to protect the medical profession, the integrity and ethics of the medical profession to make sure that healers are only healers and not killers. That's great. How about abortion? Um, protecting vulnerable populations. As Dorinda pointed out, uh, if you're poor and uneducated, you're a lot more uh, susceptible to coercion than you are if you're educated, wealthy, and have other options. Um, and so the Supreme Court said, therefore, since the Constitution is silent on the issue, it's for the states to decide. Now, what would happen if Roe is reversed, notwithstanding Ar Armageddon, and I hope David, <laughs> as much as I respect him, I hope he's wrong. Um, uh, and, and David does too. Um, re reversal of Roe, of course, would sim simply send the issue back to the states. And as David pointed out, and as others pointed out, even Lincoln, you may have heard of him, um, Lincoln said, look, the, it would not be good. He, he did not think that slavery, uh, the country could be half slave or half free. He said it would either be all one or all the other. So I understand that a federalism decision is not ideal, but I will tell you this, after 46 and a half years of the federal courts being the abortion control board, it would be better to fight it out in the states. Now, I will tell you also that a lot of politicians who say they're pro-life, I can't do anything, of course, because my hands are tied. Uh, it'll be a come to Jesus moment, so to speak, uh, because now if Roe is reversed, they're gonna have to actually take a position. Um, I think that uh, you'd go right back to rational basis review, which is simply the standard that if the law has a reasonable basis for it, that's enough. You don't have to do and dance around. You know, the undue burden standard, which is the standard that the court created out of nothing uh, 19 years after they created the right of abortion out of nothing, uh, it basically allows federal courts to, just, to do whatever it wants. To say something is an undue burden is an assertion or it's a conclusion. It's a conclusory statement. It doesn't tell you anything. Well, how do we get to an undue burden? Basically, if I like this regulation, it's not an undue burden. If I don't like it, it is. So they're conclusory. Um, the role of state constitutions will become huge, okay? But it's a lot easier to amend the state constitution than it is the federal constitution. Um, and then, this is a talk for another day because I know I'm over my time already probably, but that never stopped me. Um, uh, in, if you think about, I, I, I've spoken a lot and I was talking to David about this in Poland for the last six or seven years. And uh, I went to Krakow to speak at the Jagiellonian University, and about an hour outside of Krakow is uh, Auschwitz. And when you think about Auschwitz, you think about, uh, not that I think people are necessarily, 
necessarily uh, the equivalent of the Nazis, but I thought about the Nuremberg trials, right? The Nuremberg trials after World War II, where they uh, tried, the victorious allies tried the Nazi doctors, the Nazi judges, that is the Nazi lawyers, and the Nazi officers for crimes against humanity. You know the whole story. The defense was we were only following orders. Another way of saying this, we were only following the law of the Third Reich. And if the law required us to do this, or didn't prevent us from doing this, how can you go after us? Was it just victor's justice? Or was there something else? Well, I think that something else is the natural law. That the one thing, and this is how Durant and I speak to students all over the country, all over the world. We've been to Korea and Australia, New Zealand, all over Europe, or Caribbean, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter whether you're a male or female, black, white, or any other color, what your ethnic background is, rich or poor, whether you lived a thousand years in the past, today, or a thousand years, there are some things you cannot know. Um, two minutes, okay. That was 10 minutes ago, but thank you. Um, <laughs> There's some things you can't not know, right? And one of those, because I always tell the students, look, even a thief doesn't like to be stolen from. You could be a mafia hitman and murder with impunity, but you, someone murders your wife, you react like every other human being in history reacts, because you share the same human nature. And therefore, the natural law can be a very effective tool. And Nuremberg, I believe, stands not for victor's justice, but for the idea that because you share the same human nature and you take a little girl because she, simply because she's Jewish and you gas her to death and you burn her body, you had to know. And there's no positive law, no enacted law, no enacted decision anywhere in time or history that would allow that and make it good. And we have to recover everything else we're doing and understanding of the natural law. Legal positivism works for 98% of our life on issues, you know, there's nothing inherent about whether the tax code is this or that or whether a regulation is this way or that way. But in about 2% of the issues, the issues that really matter, okay, the moral question has to be front and center. And if the law is immoral, it can't be followed. Thank you very much. So our panel did run over, but I think we have a few minutes for questions. If there are any questions from the audience, I know it's a totally non-controversial subject, and after that piece of cheesecake, you're probably not thinking, so. <laughs> Anybody? Yes. Back and over there. Oh, back. Sorry. Um, hi, so I was just thinking about, with the first speaker in particular, um, as vitality increases as technology expands and life in the womb can um, exist beyond the womb at a younger um, age, should we be focusing our efforts on, our, our financial efforts, our, our uh, monetary efforts on aiding in this technology or, or on a more political front on our conversations that we're having with others? Thank you. I think it's, you know, it's, it's both and, um, as, our, as most issues are. Um, as science increases and ultrasound shows the unborn child, you, we have increasing amounts of people self-describing as pro-life. But then as legislation and litigation went through about partial birth abortion and people who may have self-described as pro-choice focused on the brutality and the violence of abortion, you know, you, you need all of these things coming together. Um, the embryology, as Nick mentioned, is really basic, and you would think that if we could not even talk about constitutional personhood under the 14th Amendment, can we just talk about is this or is this not a human being? Well, I want to po point out something that happened um, in South Africa. For the last two years, a 32-year-old doctor um, has been fired from his hospital and suspended from practicing medicine because he informed a woman who wanted to terminate her pregnancy that um, the fetus was a human being. He was charged by the hospital with um, dis disrespecting the dignity of the patient and using emotive language to convey his beliefs. Okay, he, it also says he failed his right of self-determination, he failed to respect her right of self-determination and her autonomy and her bodily and psychological integrity. That's simply for saying that the child, that the unborn child is a human being. 
Those are the kinds of things that are now front and center in our political debates. So we have the embryology, yes, this is a human being, but the legal and political question of who is worthy of protection. May I speak on that? Is this on? Oh, you yes. shut me off again. Okay. <laughs> uh, but you, you see what it's come to. It's no longer an issue of shading. Um, we see in the New York State uh, uh, legislation in the, in the remarks by the governor of Virginia, um, they don't care that it's life. They don't care. A termination means the death of a child. That's what they're saying. This is a question of nihilism. A, a group of people in this country have ideologically wedded themselves to nihilism. They are the same people who push dignity with death legislation, uh, who push pills in, in colleges. Um, there, there is, there, there is a, a sense of people who hate this country, who are normally in the same group, it's a nihilistic movement and shadings of, well, is it life at this point or not? It's life and they know it and they don't want it. And that's what we have to say, that this is not a question of does, when does it become a life, when is it potential life? This is life, period. And on what side are you on? And also, you know, uh, one thing to point out, people always say they've been coming to Dorinda and me for decades, oh, you know, we have the perfect theory. They read Justice Blackman and, and Roe. We don't know when life begins. Well, we're just going to give them the evidence. And I use the old um, scholastic terminology. The problem with the court is not that they don't have knowledge, okay? It's not a defect of the intellect. It's a defect of the will. They want, for political reasons, as they pointed out, as Dorinda pointed out, as uh, David pointed out, they want abortion, and that's what they're going to get. So until the Supreme Court acts with will to, re to reverse itself, a bad decision, and send it back to the states, we won't be able to make those arguments. But I do believe if it's reversed, then we're going to be able to make those arguments in state legislatures, and they'll listen a lot more than right now. One of the most uh, important um, propaganda pieces ever made in Germany in the 1930s by Leni Riefenstahl, a great uh, movie maker uh, celebrating Hitler, was called Triumph of the Will. So I, I know that there are a lot more questions, but we're already over time. In fact, you've used your break, and we're going to go right into the next panel. Okay, I'll take one. Since you okay. have a microphone, you have, you have the I last question. I have it in my hand. Um, I want to respond by using the word nihilism. What does it mean? What does it portend that there are... <clears throat> Democratic presidential nominees who have openly discussed the possibility of abortion is good for the world because it limits population and that it was not on the front page or front screen of any media. To me, the non-covering of the horror of that story what does that tell you? It t tells us of the sickness of our culture, of at least of our elite culture. The grounding of our culture and the principles of the founding is still there. It's in almost every family you go into. The same principles almost every family teaches its children are the principles of the founding. Which is self-government, self-government meaning both terms of self-government, that is one rules oneself and one rules one's passions, that's the basis of our fundamental principles. Those principles are not being articulated, in fact they're being laughed at uh, on the media when people talk about family life, for example, and family life is made fun of in comedy so often. That's, that's where the corruption is. And also I think, I know we, I'm pushing our luck here, um, that, that, that we should all know that there is not a population problem anymore. If there's a population problem, it's depopulation. Right. Okay. And it will, we won't, none of us in this room will live to see the ultimate, but go out to 2050, 60, 70, and all of a sudden the world's going to hit peak population and plunge. And countries already like China and Japan are having huge problems. I think if you ask me when I was a grad student what the worst book in the 
20th century or 19, <laughs> late 19th century, I would have said, you know, uh, uh, Karl Marx, is, you Kampf. know, my, Mein Kampf. Okay, you know, and the, I think the population bomb by John, was it Ehrlich, uh, Ehrlich w w did more damage right. because it just convinced people that somehow having children was an evil thing. And uh, so I wanted to say to all the mothers out here, or potential mothers, thank you for having children. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll, I'll that. Join me in thanking my panel. <laughs>